Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nicholas Prevelakis on behalf of the Center for Hellenic Studies and also the Committee on Degrees in Social Studies, our two Harvard partners uh, for this series uh, of events. Uh, our third partner uh, is the Cultural Services of the French uh, Embassy in the United States. Uh, this is part of a series on, of uh, events uh, related to the philosophy and ideas uh, conversations that are happening um, every year. Uh, this year's theme, uh, obviously related to what uh, we've been living this year, has been proximity. The idea is to think of what it means to be close uh, in a world where uh, much of what was taken for granted ceased to be, uh, and where we uh, uh, asked about physical proximity, emotional proximity, um, isolation, uh, and, and etc. cetera. Um, to do this, uh, we uh, organized a series of online events uh, in examining the role that proximity plays in different spheres of life, and also at the same time, asking how these different spheres of life can shed light onto this notion of proximity. In other words, ask what the, relevant of this notion, the relevance of this notion is, and at the same time, what are the different ways in which we can understand it. Uh, this is the third such event. The first one, for those who were not uh, here before, uh, was on proximity and politics. Then uh, we asked uh, about how proximity is understood uh, and we uh, inquired about proximity as directness. So we asked questions about direct democracy and ways in which it can be implemented today. We also asked about physical proximity in politics and the ways in which many people are afraid of mass politics or what does or fears of the mob, whether uh, these uh, and what extent these are justified or not justified. Uh, the second event had to do with ethics, ethical life. There we examine proximity in the form of um, empathy, uh, proximity in the sense of putting ourselves in the shoes of another person, becoming close, and through that uh, developing um, uh, moral intuitions, moral judgments, and whether or not, uh, what are the different forms that this takes, and whether or not it's a good way uh, of uh, uh, examining one's moral uh, principles. This time, uh, we are focusing on a topic that is very central and dear to us as Center for Hellenic Studies, and that is proximity in classical uh, literature uh, and classical Greek literature. We are asking what form does proximity take in classical Greek literature, and most importantly for a broader public, how can conceptualizations of proximity in classical Greek literature help us understand this notion as it applies to our lives today. Uh, for this, uh, we have um, three uh, speakers uh, whom I'm going to uh, present to you, introduce to you for those who don't know them in a moment. Before that, I would like to ask you if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat. And if you'd like to ask a question uh, yourself, raise your hand. Uh, first, we are going to have presentations by our three uh, speakers that are going to be short, 10 to 12 minutes, followed by a brief discussion uh, amongst the speakers, and then we'll open up the discussion to um, everyone. So that will be the time when you can um, ask questions uh, and or make comments. Uh, the uh, Q&A session will be uh, moderated by my colleague Dimitri Halikias, um, who is a doctoral candidate at the government department and who is working with us on these proximity and ideas uh, events. Our, three, our first speaker uh, is Professor Gregory Nash, whom I, many of you know, of course, as the faculty director of the Center for Hellenic Studies, as Francis Jones Professor of Classical Greek Literature and Comparative Literature uh, at Harvard. Uh, a specialist, of course, of uh, key Greek literature and oral traditions, uh, the person who has gathered more than tens of thousands of people through the uh, online 
uh, and extension school courses on heroes, uh, and the author of uh, books such as The Best of Ikeans, um, uh, Homer the Classic, Homer the Pre-Classic, and of course, more recently, uh, The Ancient Greek Hero in 24 Hours, the Masterpieces of Metonymy at the Center for uh, Hellenic Studies. Uh, our uh, second speaker uh, is uh, Richard Martin, uh, head of the senior fellows at the Center for Hellenic Studies, and uh, Anthony and Isabel Rodnick, professor at, uh, in classics at Stanford. Uh, Richard Martin, uh, is, uh, his research focuses on Homeric epic, Greek comedy, mythology, uh, ancient uh, religions, uh, and he's the author of many, many books, uh, such as Healing, Sacrifice, and Battle, uh, um, a Mechania and Related Concepts in Early Greek Poetry, that was back in uh, 1983, uh, and um, uh, The Language of, uh, of Heroes, Speech and Performance in the Iliad, and many books also for general audiences, such as Classical Mythology, The Basics, Myths of the Ancient Greeks, uh, and a number of articles in Greek, Latin, and Irish literature. Uh, and then, last but not least, uh, Laura Slatkin, Galatin Distinguished Professor in Interdisciplinary Studies at NYU, uh, who also does research and uh, teaches ancient Greek and Roman poetry, wisdom traditions in classical Near Eastern antiquity, gender studies, anthropological approaches to the literature of ancient Mediterranean world, and cultural poetics. Uh, she uh, um, has written uh, The Power of Thetis and selected essay, uh, essays in at Harvard University Press in 2011, uh, and has also uh, experience with, uh, and that's relevant for this series, uh, with uh, French uh, tradition of the classics, uh, having edited a book uh, that compares uh, the uh, French uh, uh, tradition um, uh, with uh, French post-war uh, French thought uh, and, uh, and um, uh, classics in the United States in 2011. 2001. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to um, Greg Nash, uh, followed by uh, the uh, uh, Richard Martin and Laura Slatkin uh, for um, their presentations. And thank you. Thank you, Nicola. And, and thank you, Dimitri. I got my PhD in 1966. That's a very long time ago. And back then, I was not known as a professor of classics. I was, may I put it this way, a linguist. And I'm still very proud of the training I received when I was young in linguistics. And that will be relevant to uh, what I will try to say in the next uh, 10 to 11 to 12 minutes. In linguistics, maybe the most intuitive of all thinkers uh, in my experience has been Emil Benveniste, B-E-N-V-E-N-I-S-T-E. -E. Notice I say Benveniste, not Bonveniste. There's a story behind that, very interesting. And linguists love to think about the prehistory of words. Uh, or a better way of saying it about the etymology of words. And so because we're talking about proximity, I'm going to put on my naive 1966 linguistics hat and say, well, proximity, that has to do with uh, physical distancing or nearing. After all, proximus in Latin would mean nearest. Well, let's go to Greek because I want to talk about things that have very much to do with the oldest forms of Greek that we know, um, which we can find in the beautiful poetry attributed to Homer, Homeric poetry, the Homeric Iliad and Odyssey. And so now I'm going to switch from uh, Latin to Greek. So how would I think of proximity in the Greek language? Well, I'll start with the word pilos, which uh, by the time we get to the fourth century before our era, 
um, this is um, um, in Athens, you would pronounce it philos, not pilos. And uh, it's usually translated as dear when it is an adjective, but as, as um, friend when it's a noun. And th this is going to be something that preoccupies me uh, for the entire stretch of my presentation. Uh, it turns out that this word, uh, philos, meaning dear as an adjective and, uh, and uh, friend as a noun, can also be used in the earliest forms of Greek, that is to say the Homeric Iliad and Odyssey, um, to refer to, for example, parts of the body. And you say, wait a minute, that, that's, uh, that's, not, that's not in line with the definitions that I've given you. For example, in Homeric Greek, you can say about your knees, philagunata, which means what? It can't mean my dear little knees. <laughs> what does it mean? Why is it that parts of the body even can be um, referred to by way of philos, this, uh, th this form in its adjectival usages? Well, um, I, I want you to be thinking about that as I now uh, recall the words of another old man. I'm switching from myself to uh, a very, very, very old man in Iliad 9. His name is Phoenix. That's the way we pronounce it today. And Phoenix was kind of like a mother figure to Achilles after he was semi-hemi-demi abandoned by um, his mother at a very early age. And my, my dear friend and colleague, Laura might want to talk about that. So could I say that this old man is a mother substitute to Achilles? Achilles is feeling very distanced from his comrades right now, his comrades at arms um, in Iliad 9, very alienated. And uh, the old man is trying to bring Achilles, the number one hero of the Iliad, bring him around. Um, uh, may I put it this way, I'll say it in French, have a rapprochement, a nearing, a, a rebuilding of relations. So he, he tells Achilles and all assembled um, in this uh, sub-narrative within the narrative of, of the Iliad, he tells a story and it starts. Um, I'll try to remember how it goes in Greek. Memne mai to de ergon ego palai utine onge, ho sein, endu min ereo pantesi philoisi. I translate this differently each time, uh, you know, do it this way. I have total recall of the thing that was done that I'm going to tell you. It didn't happen uh, uh, just yesterday, it was a very old thing. And I'm going to tell you this, um, Philoi that you are, now how am I going to translate this, friends? I'm going to tell you all, of, I'll tell you all, of the, friends as you are, all of you. Um, and, and you say, well, wait a minute. Um, there are alienated people in this audience, especially especially the recipient of the story who's supposed to learn something from this, and that's Achilles. Um, so, um, what is the story about? It's a story about a, a hero called Meleagros, sometimes pronounced Meleager or Meleager, and his wife, Cleopatra. This is not the famous Cleopatra of, um, uh, of Antony and Cleopatra. This is a uh, Cleopatra of the heroic age. And uh, I'll just give something away. Cleopatra, the name means uh, she who has the glory of the ancestors. And here glory is glory that is conferred by song, the kind of song that we hear in the Iliad. And um, it's all about 
um, distancing and and trying to remove distance. And I like the fact that it's addressed to people who are presumed to be philoi, people who are presumed to be uh, friends to each other, to be dear to each other. Hmm. Well, let's see. The story is about an alienated young man, very similar to Achilles, who is, like Achilles, sitting it out. He has uh, withdrawn himself from his society. He's so alienated from it. And so members of his society um, come to him to try to uh, talk him into coming back, to rejoining, to be, um, to be part of the society again. And there's a very interesting sequence, and I still remember what the sequence is. First, there's the elders of the community, and they have no luck in, in, in getting Meleagros to come around. Then there are the priests, then there's the father, then there are the sisters, then there's the mother, and then there is the companions in arms, the comrades. And then finally, the wife. And I won't go into the details about how it's the wife who is mentioned last, but all of this fits a model that anthropologists like to call the ascending scale of affections. And that means that you determine your own identity, your own ego, you define it by way of what your relationship is to everybody in your society, and you go bottom up. And, and so in this case, I'm already giving it away, spoiler alert, um, the wife is at the top of Meleagros' ascending scale of affection. So that's something to think about. Well, um, it, it turns out that um, when you get nearer and nearer and nearer to somebody, um, you're becoming more and more and more philos or phile if it's feminine. And it turns out that the etymology, you knew I would put on my linguistics hat, the etymology of philos turns out to be from uh, an adverb, which is still used in Homeric Greek, phi, P-H-I. And, and phi uh, means near. You see how this is perhaps relevant to proximity near. And it gets better. Um, it turns out that philos is not just near, excuse me, it's not just dear, it's near as well. And so I've fallen into the habit when I see the word philos as an adjective, I translate it as near and dear, not, not just dear. So how's that for proximity? It gets even better. It, it turns out that um, uh, when you measure uh, on an ascending scale of affection, how somebody is near and dear to you, uh, the nearer and nearer and nearer uh, somebody gets to you, what is the, how shall I say it, what is the logical um, um, uh, end goal here? Well, the end goal is you get nearer and nearer and nearer to the self, then the next thing you know, it's the self. And that's why when I talk about my knees, uh, they're philagunata, not because they're my dear little knees, but because that's, that's the, the next to last step before you reach what? The ego, the self. And um, it's interesting that the wife is at the top of the list here, right? Of the ascending scale of affection. Isn't that something to think about? Well, it turns out that the next best uh, category, the comrades in arms, guess what the Greek word is? Hetairoi, comrades. And, and I, again, I put on my linguistics hat. Um, uh, the he of hetairoi comes from a, a very ancient root, swe, which means self. So it's the self people who are almost as, as, as good as the self. Ascending scale of affection. So things are heating up, aren't they? 
And somehow this story is supposed to tell something very important to Achilles, the number one hero of the Iliad, who is sitting it out and is not joining his uh, companions in arms, is not joining his comrades. Just as this model that we're talking about, Meleagros wasn't joining. But then it turns out that uh, the wife, Cleopatra, she starts crying. And in ancient Greek song culture, when you cry, you sing, and when you sing, you cry. Um, anthropologically, you'd call it lament. And, and that's, what, that's what finally does it. And that's what brings uh, the hero of this sub story um, in sync, so to speak, with his community, who are the comrades, who are the self people that they should be. And now, how does this um, small scale story fit the larger scale story? And I'm now uh, at the 12 minute point. And here's the big, here's the big um, takeaway. Um, what does this mean for Achilles? Who is at the top of his ascending scale of affection? Well, it's his other self, Patroclus, Patroclus, which means, hello, the same thing that Cleopatra means. Um, in this case, he who has the klaus of the ancestors, he who has the glory of the ancestors, the glory that is conferred by song. So in other words, whoever is nearest and dearest to you is the best at defining the self. And I'll end my formal presentation by um, going fast forward, push the fast forward button and going all the way to Aristotle. Now we're in the uh, fourth century before our era. And Aristotle has this wonderful question. Uh, what is a philos? In other words, what's a friend? And you know what his answer is? I'll say it in Greek. Allos ego, another ego. May, may I say this in, in the pseudo-scientific Latin of Sigmund Freud, the alter ego. And that is what Patroclus is in the Iliad because he gives up his life for uh, the community, but more specifically um, for his nearest and dearest philos. And, and, and there you have it all. It's, um, how shall I say it, a story of proximity and I will end there. I will not end there, but uh, I, will, I will pause there. Pause, hope. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Greg, for this all-encompassing um, presentation. I'm, gonna say, I'm not gonna say anything. Uh, I'm gonna give the floor to uh, uh, Richard Martin, and then we'll come back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um. So if I have the floor, I would like to share a screen. Uh, and meanwhile, as I'm pressing the various buttons, thank Nicolas, Dimitrios, uh, Ali Marbury from the center, who's behind the scenes, uh, my fellow co-chair of the senior fellows, uh, Laura Slatkin, and my esteemed teacher, Regnaj. Uh, and I can always only be a footnote to Greg's master text. And so here I want to um, chime with him and rhyme with him, but puzzle over one particular word. And I hope you can all see it. Do you see this uh, handout, virtual, virtual handout? It's one word that I've been trying to um, think through which I think is related to proximity, but I'll let you guide me in the discussion. It's an odd word because it seems to mean at in some points pain, in other points care, um, in both senses in English, to care for somebody or to have a care, but also it's related to the word for funeral and it's related to a word for relatives. Notice the, um, until now, standard dictionary, Liddell, Liddell Scott Jones, LSJ, um, has two definitions for a related word, kedeia, which is just a suffixed form of this kados, care for the dead funeral mourning from an inscription in Asia Minor, and then connection by marriage alliance. That seems like a weird sort of um, blend in. 
So I wonder what the semantics are. What does it have to do with proximity? And my hypothesis has been that, well, care must mean contact of some type and contact must be able to be conceptualized even though it's not proximate. And I'll um, explain what I mean in a little while there. But my main point is that, you know, I, I think of this as like walking on deep snow with, with snowshoes. I need text in order to keep me from sinking in. And so the text that I've chosen just for today for the 12 minutes is the Iliad. And I think it can clarify with its deep wisdom of a centuries old poetic tradition, what might be going on that brings together all of these notions, pain, care, funeral relatives. But I want to start with something a little bit later, Herodotus, who in book eight uses this adjective, uh, literally proskedes means towards kados. So whatever kados means, this is in relation to or heading towards kados. It seems to mean a relation by marriage in Herodotus. So Mardonius picks out a guy to send to Athens partly because the Persians were akin to him, proskedes. Why are they the Persians akin to this character, uh, Alexander a Macedonian, not the famous Alexander the Macedonian, but a predecessor? Uh, why are the Persians related to him? Because um, there's a marriage tie. A Persian um, had taken to wife Gugaya, Alexander's sister. So proskedes here really means uh, not kin in the big sense of genealogically related, but related by marriage. Now I turn to one bit of the Odyssey where the word also comes up, but in an adjectival form, kedistoi. And notice in terms of proximity, how this comes out in translation. This is where... Um, the king of the Phaeacians speaking to Odysseus, he tries to console him and says, the gods did all of this basically so that we can get into epic poetry, that we might be a song. Did some kinsman of yours fall before Troy, uh, your daughter's husband or your wife's father? Penteros is an interesting word I can talk about later, related to the word pathos. Such as are nearest to one, Kate's story after one's kin and blood. So he's saying there's a category of people allied by marriage. They're not your kin, but they're the next step. And I think of Greg's ascending scale of affection here. They're Kate's story. So, so far, it looks like Kados is related uh, to proximity in, the, in this kind of conceptual sense, nearest to one, but not by uh, genealogy. But the Odyssey also shows that you can have non-kin and non-marriage relations described with this word. Uh, this relates to the big bow of Odysseus that he'll use to kill the suitors later. He doesn't take it with him when he goes to war. And we get a kind of backstory of the bow, which involves this character, Iphitus. Iphitus, um, Odysseus gave Iphitus a sharp sword, as the beginning of loving friendship, arcane xenosunes proskedaos. Notice here, proskedaos means like um, a guest friendship, xenosune, that will bring us together in care or pain or alliance, proskedaos. Well, they never got to finish off the recipro reciprocal relation of guest friendship because Heracles went and slew Iphitus before Iphitus could ever go to Ithaca. But Odysseus has the bow still, which is a memorial, manema, of his philos, near and dear, uh, Xenos, guest friend. Number two, just to assure you that it's not only about alliances, the word really does mean throughout the Iliad, and it occurs about 90 times, pain and sorrow. So for example, when Odysseus again, returns uh, Chris, the, the daughter of Chryses, um, who has been the sort of cause of war between Agamemnon and Achilles. 
Uh, Odysseus says, here she is again, I'm bringing her back. We're going to do a hecatomb to Apollo so we can propitiate Apollo who has heaped unhappiness and tears. That's Lattimore's translation of polustona kedea, met much groaning, what? Cares, unhappiness, pain. And Odysseus again um, is a described talking to a character in the Iliad, Sokos, whom he's just killed. He, he kills him with the spear and then he pulls the spear out of Sokos's flesh. And when it came out, the blood sprang and his heart was sickened. Again, Lattimore is trying to grapple with this word kede. Now in a verb form, he was in pain in his heart, kede de thumon. So it's pain, it's alliance, and the gods also fear it. The gods care for their near and dear, although they're not near to them, literally. And again, I think of what Greg says about the epiphany of the god. Again, the beginning of the Iliad, nine days up and down, the host, Apollo kills people. But on the 10th, Achilles calls them to figure out how to put an end to it, because Hera put it into his mind. Why? Because she, Kedata, for the Greeks. She had pity, Lattimore says. She was involved in kados, care, pain, relationship with the Greeks. A lot of times this word kados in verb form occurs with the verb to be near and dear, phileusa. So in the same scene, uh, Hera is said to have sent Athena to prevent Achilles from basically chopping off Agamemnon's head. You remember the scene where Achilles is about to stab Agamemnon and Athena pulls his hair back and he whirls around and sees her. She was sent because Hera loved both men, Agamemnon and Achilles, and cared for them. And one more bit on the gods caring at the very end of the Iliad, when uh, Zeus and the other gods want uh, the body of Hector to be returned to his father. Zeus sends Eris, the rainbow messenger, and she comes to Priam and says, uh, don't be afraid. You know, Zeus sent me. I'm a messenger of Zeus who far away cares much for you. I would even do this as a concessive, although far away, Anelthen et on, mega kedata. He's got great kados relation for you. You can see why I'm puzzled by this thing, uh, it, which seems to be love, pity, care, and pain. And we haven't even gotten to funerals. So the high point of the Iliad, uh, one of the high points, Iliad 9, is where Achilles gets to vent all of his problem with Agamemnon, with his hetairoi, his companions, and one by one, Odysseus, uh, and Phoenix and Ajax beg him in different ways to come back to the war so that the Greeks won't be totally wiped out. Notice how Achilles sums up the whole dilemma. Basically, he says, well, look, we're here to fight for Helen, who was stolen by another guy from her husband. Why am I fighting with Agamemnon? He stole from another guy a wife. Uh, or is it only Agamemnon and, and Menelaus who love their wives? Anybody who's Agathos and Ekephron, good and careful, loves her who is his own and cares for her. Philae, the philos word, and Kedatai. Even as I now love this woman, Chryseis, even though, you know, I basically took her as a captive in war, she's like my wife. Here's the speech that Greg mentioned to Phoenix. And here, Achilles still sort of warding off those who are coming to entreat him, um, says to Phoenix, you know, don't try to make good between me and Agamemnon. Stop confusing my heart uh, with lamentation and sorrow for Agamemnon. It does not become you to love, Philaen, be close to that guy, for fear you turn hateful to me. He's not giving this as the motive for Phoenix. He's saying, don't do that or you will become my ekthros, my enemy. I who love you. So basically he's saying philia, being philoi, being near and dear, being proximate, means keeping other people at a distance. 
And the one that I want you to keep at a distance is Agamemnon. But he transforms this uh, paradigm of philia, of being philos, into a paradigm of kedeia uh, or kados. Lattimore says, it should be your pride with me to hurt whoever shall hurt me. That's good old ar archaic Greek ethics. Ton kedain, to give pain to the one who gives pain to me. Finally, in this great scene of Iliad 9, Ajax, who's a sort of third on a match, takes a different tack, basically saying, hey, we're your, your buddies, we're your bros. You've got to treat us that way and come back to war. And he says, respect your house. We're under the same roof, as if that proximity is what will make the message get through. We desire beyond all others to have your honor and love. That's again how Lattimore is trying to deal with these two closely related terms, but it's kedistoi. We want to be kedistoi for you. Now remember, kedistoi way up here was um, acting like kin in Odyssey 8, the nearest to one, kedistoi, after one's own blood. Ajax, in effect, says, we know that there's a Kados relation, which is alliance by marriage. We are your hetairoi, your uh, bros. Treat us like alliances by marriage. It all comes together, and I know I have just a minute left here to explain this, in rituals of mourning, and I'll just put it this way. The ritual of mourning that you see in the Iliad, dealing with uh, basically a preview of Achilles' death is what transforms pain, kados, into proximate relationship, kados, and that's what affirms proximate social bonds. When Thetis hears that Achilles' best, Hetairos' best philos has been killed, she starts mourning for her son because she knows he's going to be next. And she says to them, um, come here, my sisters, notice the proximate relation, so you can hear my kedaa, the sorrows. Sorrows basically are the content of her mourning for her son. And she goes on to say how she gave birth to him. He sprang up like a tree. He's like uh, the pride of the orchard. Um, Patroclus is mourned as well by a sorry, uh, Briseis, yet another war bride. And she says Patroclus was most pleasing to her. He took care of her. Her own original husband had been killed. Um, and her brothers who were close to me, Kedeos. Notice the closeness comes up in the context of them being killed, actually being killed by Achilles who then takes Briseis as his war bride. And finally, when it comes to lamenting and burning the corpse of Patroclus, Achilles says to Agamemnon, okay, we've got the pyre ready. Get rid of the other people. Tell them to scatter from this pyre. Go get their dinner. But we who are concerned with the dead man, Kedaos esti nekus, there is, uh, for us, the, the corpse, the nekos, deserves kados. We're going to do the work of the burial. We are the close mourners, kedemones. And they stayed by the place and piled up the timber for the pyre. Well, final point, as the Iliad brilliantly always does, that total blackness of Patroclus dying and being burnt is immediately contrasted in the same book with the, the games. And here, the Kedemones, who we saw as the close mourners piling, piling up the timber, turn out to be uh, part of the threat or boast when Epeos, who's actually the guy who constructed the Trojan horse, says, hey, I'm going to get into the boxing contest. And I'll tell you, I'm going to smash my opponent's skin apart and break his bones. And the people who care for him, Kedemones, should wait nearby in a huddle to carry him out. He's going to be like near dead. Uh, 
I will pose to you as a bonus question. We don't know the etymology of kados, but there is a distant derivative in English, and I'll let you try to guess what that is. Uh, but let me just close my big question right now. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. As we, as we try to guess the derivative that, that you said, uh, our Greek friends here, and, and you, of course, too, know that kidemonas now in modern Greek is used uh, to say guardian, right? If you, if you have to, if you're underage and you have to sign something, you cannot sign. It's your legal guardian who signs for you. And that's your kidemonas, the person who takes care of you. That's the caring. Yeah. However, it, it, I'm aware that the modern Greek word for funeral is kidia. Yeah. So you've still got both. Yep, exactly. Air and care for the dead. Exactly, exactly. So thank you again, no comment for now, but um, um, Laura, uh, if you're ready, floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, um, Nicola and Demetrios and Ali the wizard behind the scenes um, and thank you for this wonderful invitation. And it's so great to see some old friends here um, and uh, to be with uh, Greg and Richard um, and uh, Richard, my co-chair and Greg, as Richard said, our teacher. Um, so this is a, is a real pleasure. Um, and I'm, I'm going to share a screen in a second, um, but just to say that um, I thought I would take my cue from Greg talking about philos um, and, um, and, and some of Richard's um, discussion uh, to think a little bit about the Iliad's language of proximity and especially proximity on the battlefield. And this was something I had thought about um, some time ago and wanted to return to. So this is a, is a great opportunity. Um, and I thought about it in various ways, including in relation to supplication um, and so forth. But this, this um, uh, these thoughts today, um, which I, I hope you will um, all help me with and contribute to um, or, or go in a somewhat different direction. Greg pointed out how the terms having to do with, with um, philos and, and philia presuppose closeness in their etymological basis. That is, the condition of being philos is the definition of proximity, of being right there for someone. Um, and this is borne out repeatedly in the battle episodes of the Iliad, where one of the most common narrative um, patterns describing entry into combat is that a warrior is wounded or killed um, and a friend or close relative, viz. Kados, um, uh, sees and is stricken with pity or grief and plunges more deeply into the fray to rescue his friend or to recover his body. Um, and there are countless examples to illustrate the reality underlying the ideology of philotes, the being with um, of the band of brothers, the hetairoi that Greg was talking about. Um, to illustrate the reality that in battle, your life is as fully in the hands of your friend as of your enemy. Um, and ultimately what happens to you is in the hands of your friend um, as much as of the enemy. So nothing is more evident in the Iliad than the absolute dependence of the philoi on each other for their lives. And although this is obviously true of the band of fighters as a whole. It's given clearest expression through the representation of warriors joined in closely linked pairs. Um, and you, you see it in, um, in terms of uh, um, the, the sort of prospect of military aggression. So 
um, Achilles says to Patroclus in book 16, you know, if only you and I alone, Patroclus, could take the citadel of Troy. And Diomedes um, says to his, his Hetairos Thanalos, um, we could do it, you and I together could take Troy. Um, and there are other examples, but from the beginning, the, the, the poem's emphasis is on the mutual efforts of the philoi to protect each other. Um, and from really from the, you know, um, sort of earliest um, representations of the, of the, of the band of brothers of the Mennerbund. Um, and, you know, parenthetically to say that um, this is what we might think about when Achilles, or what we do think about when Achilles um, explains how um, in, in book 16, how he explains to Patroclus how um, Agamemnon has offended him and says Agamemnon treated him as a metanastes, as an outsider, as an exile. Um, and, and this is something, I mean, the whole, um, the whole problem of exile and, um, and its meaning is something we also might want to think about later on, um, thinking about how it um, works in the imagination in tragedy, um, in, in, um, in Athenian tragedy as well. So that might be something we will talk about later on. But the, the battle books, to come back to, to the Iliad, the battle books are composed for the most part of actions of warriors in pairs. And an example of a pair of warriors at work, um, and here I'm gonna try to share my screen one second. Uh, let's see. Yeah. If I can do that, just a couple of passages here. Um, yeah, I mean, this is an example from book eight in the Iliad. Um, the brothers, Teucer and Ajax, um, on the battlefield. And here you see um, Teucer. Uh, these are Lattimore's translations, Teocross, bending into position the curved bow, took his place in the shelter of his brother, uh, his brother Telamonian Ias's shield. As Ias lifted the shield to take him, the hero would watch whenever in the throng he had struck some man with an arrow, and as the man dropped and died where he was stricken, the archer would run back and again, would run back again like a child to the arms of his mother, to Ayas, who would hide him in the glittering shield's protection. Um, uh, so, you know, the fraternal bond is the, the model for countless pairings of which the larger collective is composed um, and of which Achilles and Patroclus that that bond, which as Greg was saying, you know, is the 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 eye and the other eye. Um, Achilles and Patroclus are only one fully elaborated instance, but there are many um, many throughout the Iliad. So your philos. Um, closest to is closest to you, who knows you better than your philos? Um, well, nobody maybe, um, but the Iliad proposes that there's someone who knows you equally well, and that's your enemy. Uh, let me see if I can, can I stop sharing here? I'm going to stop sharing and start sharing again. Um, 
Yeah, and that's your enemy. Um, and there have been some very um, important studies of the common vocabulary of military combat and erotic relations. Um, Hélène Monsacré, for example, whose book is on the um, a CHS website with an introduction by Richard Martin, um, uh, has, has an important study of this. Um, so the use of the terms to mingle, magnamy, that are, that's used both for erotic conjunctions and military ones, and the language of desire, the pothe, the desire for Achilles, um, or in such metaphors as the one Hector uses when he tells Ajax, um, whom he's about to meet in single combat, uh, that he knows how to dance the dance of Ares. Um, and this is a central aspect of the way in which the Iliad develops the paradox of the intimate enemy. And it's this kind of figuration that Hector evokes, let me share my screen again. Um, and then I'm gonna actually, I won't share it yet. I'm, I'll just read you the, um, the translation of the passage in, in English. Um, he, um, when, uh, when he is, um, when he's facing Achilles in book 22, he's facing him at the end, at his end, <laughs> Hector's end. Um, and he says, he considers putting down his shield. You all remember this passage, of course, putting down his shield and going up to Achilles and promising that he'll give back Helen um, and all the things that the, that, um, that Alexandros brought back, Paris brought back to Troy and the, where the beginning of the quarrel and so forth. And then he says, so he's thinking about this. And then he says, but why does the heart within me debate on these things? I might go up to him and he take no pity on me nor respect my position, but kill me naked so as if I were a woman once I stripped my armor from me. There's no way anymore from a tree or a rock to talk to him gently, whispering like a young man and a young girl in the way a young man and a young maiden whisper together. So this is the word oarizo, or zane, um, that Lattimore translates whisper. So it's, this is, the kind of figuration, uh, um, as I was saying, that Hector evokes with this word, oarizo, um, to whisper together. And he evokes it finally in order to, to negate it or to deconstruct it um, when he's facing Achilles at the end. In other words, that, that figure of the, um, the erotic, um, it, 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 uh, resonance and so forth of closeness on the battlefield you know he Hector finally refuses saying there's no way for him to have a tete-a-tete -tete with Achilles the way a boy and a girl whisper to each other on a date um, uh, and if we think about Achilles the description of Achilles as he's taking aim a little bit further on in book 22 um, taking aim at Hector, about to kill him. He looks, the poem describes him looking for where Hector's neck is the softest and most delicate. So the individual who knows your body, who scrutinizes your body in most carefully in every detail, you know, who knows the particulars of your strengths and weaknesses and apprehends your courage and your deepest fear, who's with you at the final moment, that person is your enemy, as the Iliad represents it. But another dimension of this that extends beyond the corporeal is in the verbal exchanges on the battlefield at those final moments that capture this strange and powerful intimacy. 
your friends pity you, your story, they pity you, they grieve for you, they avenge you, but it's your killer who speaks your disappointed hopes. Now I'm going to share the screen again. Let's see if I can move this down. Here we are, this is, this is in a passage three, this is um, the, when the Greek the Cretan leader, Idomeneus, addresses um, the body, he addresses the corpse of the Trojan ally, Othryoneus, whom he's just killed. And Idomeneus tells Othryoneus' story, the, the promises now never to be fulfilled, by which Othryoneus was to have received Priam's daughter in marriage in return for beating the Greeks back from the city. So he says, Othryoneus, I congratulate you beyond all others. If it is here that you will bring to pass what you promised to Dardanian Priam, his, who promised you his daughter, who in turn promised you his daughter. See now, we would also make you a promise and we would fulfill it. We would give you the loveliest of Atreides' daughters and bring her here from Argos to be your wife, if you joined us and helped us storm the strong founded city of Ilion, come then with me so we can meet by our seafaring vessels about a marriage. We here are not bad matchmakers for you. And a related example um, might be the words of um, of uh, Patroclus to the Trojan Cebriones. Uh, this is in Iliad book 16, when Cebriones falls from his chariot, as he dies, he falls from his chariot. Um, and, uh, and Patroclus says, see now what a light man this is, how agile an acrobat. If only he were somewhere on the sea where the fish swarm, he could fill the hunger of many men by diving for oysters. He could go overboard from a boat, even in rough weather, the way he somersaults so light from the ground to the ground from his chariot now. So to be sure in Troy also they have their acrobats. So I simply want to um, you know, propose thinking about um, the way these speeches the the um, in their intimacy, um, these speeches have the have the the power to reinforce, um, as it were, that that um, that closeness, that identity, in some sense, um, you know, as we think about, as we know about the Iliad, you know, as a narrative that, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't make um, the Greeks into good guys and the Trojans into bad guys or vice versa, you know, but it really, um, it really, as it were, um, equalizes them and, and puts them on the same footing. And, and there's a sense in which these speeches, and we might also think about um, the way Hector speaks to the dying Patroclus or Achilles to the dying Hector, where he says, I know what you thought. You know, you thought um, you were going to, um, you know, Achilles says to Patroclus, I mean, to um, Hector, you know, you thought you were going to storm you were going to, you know, protect the city and so forth. Patroclus says to, uh, Hector says to, you know, Patroclus, you thought you'd take the city um, and so forth. You know, speaking to the corpses, these, speaking the, the, the hopes and the desires um, of these, um, of these battlefield, um, you know, combatants, battlefield enemies. Um, so, you know, simply to say that the Iliad gives, you know, through these, these words of intimacy, gives the warrior the power not just to destroy, but also, you know, in some sense to transfigure 
um, to to become the um, the as it were the 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 shadow, the sort of negative image of the of the heteros, you know, and to bring the image of domesticity of private existence onto the battlefield to to reproduce a world beyond the plane of Troy. Um, and uh, and and through these words, the the hero, in some sense, the hero keeps on fighting, um, and he addresses his enemy as though he could hear, and in some sense, he brings him back to life. So, these are just some thoughts um, uh, that I hope we can um, um, maybe discuss further and take to uh, to um, some more. Um, further material. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, many thanks to everyone. Uh, I'll be very short because we're a little bit running out of time. I'm going to ask one or two questions and then um, and then we'll open it up um, and then Dimitri will take over. Um, I really liked how we started with friendship and, and proximity, like bodily proximity, right? Our, our, our body parts as near and then ended with enemy. Right, and proximity uh, as the enemy, as the person who knows you the most. And, and through, of course, kinship and care, ascending scales of affection. There's just so much richness uh, in the uh, um, uh, Homeric poetry that, that can inform uh, our notion of proximity. Uh, to go back to um, our French partners, uh, as, as we went to proxi from proximity to the notion of the self, the text that immediately came to mind is from Pascal, um, Qu'est-ce que le moi, what is the self? Where he says, a man goes to the window to see the people passing by. If I pass by, can I say that he went there to see me? Which is, of course, a reversal of Descartes' image where he is at the window, the self is at the window, looking at people passing by and, and reconstructing them. And Pascal says, no, if you want to think about the self, you are the person on the street and somebody else is looking at you and you wonder if he looks at you. It's the other that constitutes you. You are constituted by your relations. You are not um, the primary self looking at others. Uh, and so my first um, question to uh, all of you is that, can we find something like not only knowledge of our, ourselves through the person who approximate, but constitution of the self through relations of proximity uh, in uh, in Homeric poetry, does it make sense to uh, uh, to go that way? That's question number one. Question number two: um, As we explored uh, notions of uh, uh, lament, uh, pity, sorrow, and creation of bonds of proximity through that, do we also get, and to what extent, similar creation of bonds through um, sharing of joy, uh, feast? Um, and, and to what extent, and is there something about sorrow and, uh, and lament in particular that's more conducive to care um, and, uh, and proximity? I'm looking at Dimitri and I know that Adam Smith has discussed a lot uh, the ways in which um, sharing other people's joy versus other people's sorrow creates more or less uh, empathy. These are two very general questions, not specific at all. Um, for, for you. Let's take maybe 10 minutes for, for anything that you three want to tell yourselves and then we'll, we'll maybe Dimitri will take questions from the audience. Thank you all very, very much. Richard, it looks like you want to. Oh, I, I just pushed the button because the host wanted me to unmute. But as long as I'm unmuted, um, you know, let me say that for the question about the self, I do think just thinking of Iliad and Odyssey, which are rich enough to keep us here for years, um, the idea seems to be that there is no independent self or that when you try to be an independent self, you know, you suffer consequences. So 
integration with society is always an aim. On the other hand, in order to really serve that society, you have to go out to the edge of experience, whether Odysseus or Achilles, um, and learn, you know, where the cliff drops off. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I still wrestle with what the Iliad means every day. It seems to be saying sometimes, yes, you are ultimately alone. You can't get your friends to die for you. Um, but the only way you're going to learn that is when your friends die for you. Mm. And on the second question of, you know, just in my, my personal bit of this discussion, um, you might say, okay, how come a feast cannot be the place where you show your relationship to others as uh, involved in a kados relation to keep it at that very neutral uh, mm. translation? Um, it's as if the culture is saying, you know, it's at funerals that you really know who your friends are. So again, it's the same sort of picture. Once you're dead, then you know who your friends are. Um, or, and the society knows who your KD stoy are mm -hmm. once you are no longer there. Now, this is probably totally personal to me and raised in uh, Boston, Irish American uh, death culture. I probably attended more wakes before I was 10 years old than most people have in their lifetime. Um, <laughs> But that's the wake is where 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 it's at, right? That's where you know who your community is. Yes, I I, I hope Nicola and Dimitri that you're going to press Richard about the etymology of Kedos, because he's asking everybody to guess. Yes. And, and I don't see anybody guessing yet. Well, so the etymology supposedly is unclear, although Chantrem, <laughs> I think the, the etymology, no, is not, not Chantrem, maybe Bix, who says, uh, you know, it should pattern with uh, Germanic, uh, the word that ultimately gives us hate. Yeah, so there your you K's, go. Your K's go to your H and your D's go to your T. And the, I don't know. I don't know how you work out those semantics, uh, but I what I the question was what the ultimate one of the derivatives is in English. We don't have a um, direct derivative, uh, but there's an interesting derivative, and I was going to start with that, and then I figured it would take even much much longer. I already went over my time. So anybody guess? You could have googled it by now. Oh, no, no, it's unfair. Let me share the screen, okay? I've got it all <laughs> queued up. You'll never guess this. You see that? And I had to press the OED little <laughs> uh, microphone thing to he hear people pronounce this, because I've never heard it pronounced in English. I would say acidy, but they say axidy. Which comes from acidi, which comes from akidia, which is an alternation of akedea, which is without kados. <laughs> and I love the uh, Piers Plowman. And after all this excess, uh, he had an acidi <laughs> that he slept on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> That's real. That's the acidi I intend to have. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, and That's great. And and, and Richard, may I add something to what you and, and Laura were talking about? I, I think there's a point of, of, of convergence that I just have to share. And once again, we're going to um, um, deal with etymologies. And I, I love the fact that in Latin, the, um, the word that we translate as sister, soror, uh, can be... Uh, etymologized as sue sor, which would be self woman. In other, in other words, a woman who is the self. Um, and, and that brings me to something that I have stumbled on uh, recently, um, which is that if I'm right, the, the great poetess Sappho uh, is a speaking name and it's if I'm right, uh, Sappho means sister. And the reason I mentioned that is that um, 
Richard was uh, was um, talking about uh, Greg's riff about epiphany because he and Laura and I were talking about it. But basically, in Sappho song thirty one, where uh, an epiphany happens, and it's a god who appears, so it seems, from a million light years away, but presto, the god is here among us suddenly. So you have maximum proximity, even though he should be a, a million light years away. The pronoun that is used in Greek, this is weird, is kenos, which is, um, what's the term that linguists use? Uh, distal. You know, hodeheda toda means uh, this from my point of view, Hutos haute tuto means this from your point of view. And then a kenos is that one. So how come when a god manifests himself, in this case, it's a male god uh, whose epiphany is conjured, that, that instead of saying this one from my point of view or this one from your point of view, no, that one. It's because he's still a million light years away, but somehow he's here. And, and going back to uh, Laura's distinction of, um, of uh, f maximum friend, maximum enemy, it, it's again what, uh, I don't know, uh, Jung would call a coincidence of opposites. If you push opposites far enough, you come out at the other end. That's a friendly suggestion, haha, -ha, friendly to Laura. <laughs> I, I take it on the friendly, the friendly axis. <laughs> There's a question in the chat, Nicola. Yes, I was waiting for Dimitri to. Uh, uh, Sorry, Dimitri. What's happening? And um... yes, great. Well, why don't we just go straight there? So uh, we've got a couple questions that go together. So Bill and Maria, why don't you both unmute yourselves? Um, and Ali, can we get the screen back to? Oh wait, it's the screen's on gallery. Never mind. Uh, but so. Uh, yes, yeah, so Bill and uh, Maria, why don't you unmute yourselves and ask your, introduce yourselves and ask your, your questions. Uh, I guess I'll go first, since I'm first on the list. This is Bill Moulton um, with uh, Cosmos Society. And uh, all the examples about friendship and in-laws and even enemies were uh, about heroes. And I wonder how it relates between the gods. And Maria, why don't you just go ahead and ask yours so we can just put everything out together. Okay, thank you. I'm Maria from Argentina and I'm also a, a participant of Cosmos Society. And well, in relation to this question, I, I, I want to ask if, uh, if we can understand, uh, how can, can we understand proximity in the relationship between men and gods, not mm -hmm. only gods? Uh, because I think that uh, in this limit, to be near to them or to be or, or apart from them, because there are things that we cannot, uh, I, that, that we cannot um, be near, too near to them. Well, that maybe explains what we are. So explains the self, maybe. I, I, I wanted to add that, I think. It could be productive to think about this proximity. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to jump in, but I don't want to preclude others from. Uh, is this question and answer time? Is it answer yeah, time? Yeah, so okay. just, so yeah. So anyone on the panel, I think, just jump on in and. So not an answer, but I think it would be a really important experiment to see whether the gods are ever described as having, as being phyloid to one another. I just don't know. I think of the Ares, uh, Aphrodite and Hephaestus triangle in Odyssey book eight, where uh, Poseidon is willing to go bail for Ares. 
Um, but I don't think it's a filia relation. Maybe it's charis, which is kind of reciprocal uh, action. And the other point there that I think, uh, you know, the questioners bring up is the love of gods for people. I remember hearing a long time ago that in Greek, if you said the, the, the sort of Christian concept, the love of God, either people's love towards God or God's love towards people, it would just be incomprehensible in, you know, pre-Christian Greek. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the Iliad says, hey, Hera uh, and Athena and Zeus send down representatives or appear themselves because they have philia and they have a kados relationship. So there is something close to it. I also just want to give a shout out to all our friends in Argentina. It's great to see you on here. Terrific. Wish we'd be down there. Good. Um, why don't we, M Maria had, uh, Zanthu had also asked a question. And why don't, Maria, why don't you unmute yourself and put your question to the panel? Uh, thank you very much to the members of our wonderful panel, um, to Greg, Laura, and of course to Richard. Uh, what triggered uh, my question was Richard Martin's very insightful comment about Hidea, mm -hmm. which, um, well, as we all know, ritual Kidea still exists in many parts in modern Greece, although in uh, urban centers, uh, we don't see it that often. Uh, and it is true what uh, Richard just uh, said, that there is a ritualistic proximity in, uh, in Greek Kidea, which has which is related or parallel, of course, to the uh, religious part, but let's leave this aside for the moment. So could any one of you, all three of you or Richard, tell us something more about this ritualistic proximity in a space or um, uh, uh, at a time space like Kedia, like funeral, how relations are ritualized. Because I remember, because the, the last time I experienced it we, we, was with one of our family members. And, uh, and uh, I have to tell you that it was, I could really understand that it was very ritualized. There were certain things, it was like a choreography. And the, the funny thing is that these people, though they were illiterate, they knew how to do this, to take these ritualized steps in order to organize this proximity. So thank you very much. Well, should I take that as an invitation to speak, you know, a couple of points, uh, Maria? You know, I think of the proto necrotafio in Athens, uh, where you enter, and on the left, there's, there's basically a banqueting hall where everybody gathers. And so it came up, you know, why not feasting as the ritual place rather than funerals? I don't think you can take them apart. Every funeral is a feast. Not every feast is a funeral, but having attended some uh, dinners in uh, the mountains of Crete, there are there's some near misses there uh, when people pull out their uh, pistols and start jubilantly firing. Uh, the other component, I think, is that in forming the space, it, it really still, you know, we, we try to find ways to be present at a funeral, sending flowers or telegrams in the old days, uh, but there's still a kind of scale of affection evident there. So the ritualization brings me to one other thing about Greek funerals. And this one I haven't experienced, thank God, uh, but I've read Nadia Serimetakis' book on money, uh, divination and death. And in the money, even in the eighties, 
uh, at funerals when things really got heated and people were mourning like crazy, they would go down to the ossuary and take the box of bones of uh, people who died a few years ago and bring them into the center of the room so that the proximity with the dead was right in front of you. And then people start fainting and, and it gets really crazy. But uh, Nadia Sedimatakis describes all that. So there is something that there's something purgative and cathartic about that ritual, but it's also something very policing about who's in the room and who is it. Well, that actually ties beautifully to uh, Offrey's question uh, that Jude put in the chat. So I don't know, Offrey, if you would you like to unmute yourself and put your question to the panel? Um, yeah, actually that's uh, an excellent segue. Um, so I was, I was wondering about the, I guess proximity and the, the different degrees of closeness, um, particularly as we think of um, people who are exiled from the community or um, on the fringes. So someone compared, you know, comparing someone like, you know, Sappho or Kilikas who is in exile or even the philosopher king who goes through a period of exile um, as opposed to people who are in the polis but not don't have a seat at the table, um, sort of, you know, within the community, but don't um, partake in certain aspects of the ritual and how that um, either, you know, defines the community or parallels the sort of system of affection. Um, and particularly in the bringing in of the dead, I was, I was interested in that as well. I'm, I'm wondering if I could say something which is, I think, pertinent. It's at the end of the Iliad, and it's where uh, finally there's some kind of an understanding between Achilles and then the father of the person that he hates more than anybody in the world. And I hope that Laura will comment on this. And it's the strangest thing he does uh, to us, where Achilles says to Priam, the father of Hector, uh, whose body uh, is going to be given back to Priam, and, and they're weeping and, uh, and uh, in a sense, lamenting and lamenting and weeping, et cetera. And, and then at one point, Achilles says to Priam, okay, let's eat. Even Niobe ate. And uh, for, for most of my life, I never understood, so what? Uh, um, well, it turns out that, of course, Niobe has more grief, more kedos than anybody in all of myth because of uh, the grief that she experienced when Apollo and Artemis died, uh, uh, killed these perfect children. And so there she is transformed uh, as a rock that weeps forever. It, it, this is going to be forever. But even Niobe has to take a break and attend the funeral uh, banquet. And then she can go back and then weep and lament forever. And so basically Achilles is saying, okay, Priam, you have it pretty bad. You lost all your children. But think about Niobe who weeps forever. Even he had a, um, uh, even she had a, um, a, a funeral banquet. Would you agree, dear Laura, or? Uh, yes, no, no, I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, so this is, you know, and this is how things um, things follow, you know, and the next thing and the thing that, you know, will end the Iliad is that funeral, um, <laughs> you know, and, and it's the enemy's funeral. So what's going on, Laura? <laughs> the enemy's funeral and 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 the and the well, this is I mean, this is you know, precisely in this way, how the, you know, how the Iliad culminates in that, you know, and one might say resolves that, um, you know, that sort of ambiguity or, or you know, that sort of duality um, of the, you know, the, the enemy who is your intimate and so forth, you know, that's exactly what it does in, in 24. And so, so Achilles can say, okay, you know, you can have the funeral, you can have the banquet, 
um, you know, this is, uh, you know, and, and again, you know, it's, it's that, it's that business of the enemy knowing your, you know, what your suffering consists of, um, you know, or what your, what your, you know, parfait mm -hmm. consists of. Um, so yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. Um, but that's, it is, that's what, you know, in some sense, you know, is, is what the, you know, what the Achilles and Priam, you know, it could be like one of those things on the battlefield where, you know, Achilles, you know, kills Priam and talks to his corpse, but instead, you know, it's going to you know, it's going to be transformed. I mean, it is transformed into, you know, speaking not to the corpse, but about the corpse, so to speak, um, between the, you know, between the enemy, you know, father and, and killer of the children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Maybe we can take... Uh... Uh, well, we'll see how much, at least one more. Um, so, Anne, you uh, wrote into the chat. Would you like to mute and put the question to the group? It, it was more of an observation. And, and since I wrote it, um, I remembered Penthesilia. Um, but it, I, I did wonder how far the analysis could be extended to other groups, which mm -hmm. is what someone else mentioned earlier. Um, wh where are slaves here? Where are the metics and, and um, the barbarians? And of course, where are the women? Um, and, and because a lot of women, the Bacchae and so on, are seen, groups of women are seen as a threat. But be within those groups, they presumably experience the kind of collectivity that, that you've described the warriors experiencing. Um, and then I remember Penthesilia and... Uh, so, so that, that's the way my, my mind was, was wondering, how, how far can the uh, analysis be uh, extended for the groups? Um, if, if I may say, uh, the, the name of Penthesilea, okay, here I am being etymological again, means exactly the same thing as the name of Achilles. Sorrow for the people, but what kind of sorrow? Right. Sorrow by way of lamentation. And you know, in vase paintings, Anne, you know this as well yes. as I do, in vase paintings, um, you see the moment where Achilles kills Penthesilea and their mm -hmm. eyes meet for the first time. And I, I have moral reservations about what, what's going on here, but essentially that's when Achilles falls in love with an alter ego, who in this case is a feminine alter ego. Mm. Uh, and so we could explore this a lot further. And if I leave it at that, I feel, I feel that I'm not doing my job in exploring all the moral problems here, but um, there it is. It's, may I put it this way, love at first sight, or there used to be a stupid uh, vampire movie that was called Love at First Bite. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is, you know, it's there's material here for a thesis, isn't there? Oh if, yeah. If you if you went into all of it, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, I realize it's uh, eleven. It's one thirty, right? It's time to uh, um, time to close this event, which could go on for hours. Um, and, and, and all of us to take our notes and start organizing and, and processing all of that. I wanna thank um, everyone. Um, well, Ali, first of all, for making this possible one more time and for playing with the different templates every time. This, this time it was Zoom, the previous one was webinar. So thank you for, uh, uh, for making all this uh, possible. Many thanks to, to Dimitri. Uh, uh, my, my colleague in these events, and, and of course to um, Laura, uh, Greg, uh, and Richard for this fantastic um, performance, and, and uh, which, which helps us understand and enriches, of course, our understanding of proximity in an inimaginable way. Um, that closes the cycle of these proximity events for this semester, but it's only to be continued, uh, hopefully. 
Uh, and um, so uh, see you all soon. And thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming. Can I thank Ofri and also Jack for the grist for my mill, which I would like to follow up on. Maybe, maybe Nicola will invite us back, and we'll and we'll follow we'll follow um, with some of these very interesting questions. Thank you. What great questions we got! What a feast! No, I'm not playing with words here. What a feast!